Okay, well, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm here from Chainfrog, which is uh, a Finnish blockchain technology startup. As far as we're aware, I think we're the first blockchain technology startup in Finland. Um, and I'm here today to talk about Drupal and blockchain. So I'm uh, Kirfin Lovates, I'm the CEO of the company. We've been going for about six months now. Um, up. And the title I uh, gave this talk was Blockchaining the Backend. So when you're talking about blockchain, we're not really interested in the web front end part. We're interested a bit more in the mechanics behind things. Um, and in particular, I'm going to address the question, what can blockchain do for Drupal? So an overview of what I'll be talking about. Uh, I think it's best if I go through some blockchain basics. I'm not going to be giving a two-hour lecture on how blockchains work, just touching on what are the features that make them interesting. Um, in the middle, I'll uh, discuss how Drupal and blockchain might relate to each other, how blockchains might be useful for Drupal. And uh, finally, I'll uh, talk a bit about how would you go about deploying a blockchain solution. So we'll just cover one thing briefly, which is um, you have to be aware some people get confused between Bitcoin and blockchain. And they are two totally separate things. Um, Bitcoin is a value transfer and storage protocol, and it's built on top of blockchain, which is a technology platform. So the two are intertwined because Bitcoin was the first system to use a true blockchain. But when I'm talking about blockchain, don't immediately think cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin. Okay, so let's get straight to it and look at the question, what is a blockchain? And to a lot of people, when they hear it at first, they think, oh gosh, it's one of those big, slow, complicated databases. Um, so if I address all those individual words, then we can get a clear idea. Um, so the first one, big. Now, it's true that Bitcoin's blockchain file is currently at about 130 gigabytes, and that's big. Um, but Bitcoin has been running for eight or nine years now, and it's got over 220 million transactions stored on it. And every day, there's about 60,000 new addresses being created, um, and there's about 4,000 transactions every 10 minutes going on. So you'd expect it to be large. So just because it's a blockchain doesn't mean it's going to explode into some huge monster of a database. Um, looking at the word slow, some people have expressed concern about the rate of transactions in blockchains. And again, going to Bitcoin, it allows seven transactions every um, second, which is not a lot of transactions. But again, that's a limitation of the initial design of the Bitcoin system. If you look at other blockchains, um, multi-chain can handle about 70 or 80 transactions a second, I believe. Uh, big chain DB can handle tens of thousands of uh, transactions at a peak load. Um, so they don't have to be slow. It again depends on what you design and what you choose. Um, so complicated. Well, that one I'll have to give you. If you actually want to understand the mechanics of uh, how a blockchain works, you need to understand a bit about game theory, a bit about cryptography, a bit about peer-to-peer -peer networking. So if you're going to actually write a blockchain, it is complicated. But we're at the early stages of this technology, and it's being productized. And hopefully, just as is the case with databases, um, in the not-too-distant future, people won't have to worry about what's actually going on under the hood. And these days, if you take a database, you need to learn a bit of SQL if you want to mess around with it. But nobody actually goes in other than database designers and messes around with the code. It's just there as a product. And I think we're fairly rapidly moving towards the same thing with blockchain, that it's going to be productized. It's just going to be something that you install, um, and it sits there, and you almost forget about it. Um, and finally, database. Well, it's a method for storing data on a computer in an organized manner. And um, some people would argue that Excel is a database. And if, it, if Excel is a database, then blockchains are definitely databases. They just don't happen to be SQL-driven relational databases. Um, 
So two out of four of those words are true. Um, so what I'm going to do now is look at some of the features of blockchains that are actually of interest. Um, and I picked out the ones that I think are more relevant to Drupal. And that brings us to four. The top one sort of stands on its own. Blockchains are tamper-proof. In a normal database, you can go in and you can edit records. And if you're an administrator, you can go in and edit the administrator's log, and nobody knows that you changed it. Um, so uh, with blockchains, that's not possible. So it's one kind of difference between traditional databases and blockchain databases. And then the other three are colored in similar sort of blue colors because they are kind of related to each other. Uh, blockchains are collaborative, they're disintermediated, and they're distributed. And I'll kind of go over them in the next few slides. So I touched on the tamper-proof part already. Um, as it says, their history cannot be edited. And this means that they have applications in areas such as financial ledgers. If you have an account book, that's a record that you don't want to be able to change. Um, and you know, if you look at sort of account books in the past when they're written on paper, um, you know, you have people signing stuff and you want to make sure you're using indelible ink because you don't want your accountant going back later and deleting some transactions, rubbing them out or changing them, adding a zero here and there. So in that sense, blockchains lend themselves very nicely to financial ledgers. And related to that, you have things like audit trails and compliance. If you want to have a record of what an administrator of a system does, then it would be a good idea to stick it on a blockchain because that stops people from going back and changing it. Um, and similarly, compliance, if you have to show a regulator that you've obeyed a particular law, um, having a blockchain gives you a, a record that says, look, this is genuine. This was as it was written back then. I haven't changed it. Um, and then sort of, you can keep coming up with use cases. I think if a group of five people sit down together and take this one feature, I bet within 20 minutes they can come up with 20 cases where having a, a digital record that can't be changed would be of use. Um, I put down their property rights. You know, if you look at a, a certificate of ownership of an apartment or a house, that's something you don't want to be able to fake. That could be something that could be moved onto a blockchain. Um, and the thing is that they are not entirely tamper-proof, but as time goes on, the earlier data gets kind of locked down harder and harder until it becomes mathematically um, almost improbable that you would be able to change earlier records. There is a small probability you could do it, but it's kind of one of these once in the lifetime of a universe things that you could um, manage to guess the right number in order to change an earlier record. So I think that's enough about tamper proof. We'll move on to collaborative. So blockchains use uh, a consensus protocol, um, which is informed by mathematical game theory. And this consensus protocol means you're allowed to participate on the blockchain if you obey the rules. And if you don't, everybody ignores what you're trying to do on the blockchain and your data doesn't go on to it. Um, and this allows blockchains to build trust between participants. So you're in a situation now where um, you can have maybe a consortium of companies sharing their data on a blockchain. Uh, if you have a big enough company, if some of you work for large companies, you know that the departments within companies are almost like mini companies in their own right competing with each other. Um, so uh, it allows departments to share data in a kind of more open and trust building manner. Um, another case is where you have one company that's got different um, offices in different countries and those offices fall under different laws. Um, I'm thinking here, for example, about banks. Uh, they actually, banks actually have internal clearing houses for transactions between um, different branches in different countries. Um, so they actually have to set up their own little clearing house within a bank to handle sending money between departments. So that might be an area where a blockchain through its collaborative nature could help. And finally, a big one is that you can actually, if you set up your consensus protocol correctly in the way that Bitcoin has, you can actually allow true public access. You can say anybody can install this software, download it, connect to a blockchain, and actually start writing data to it. And it's kind of what you're doing if you have a, like a public forum, like a, a bulletin board or a blog, um, where you allow people to write on it. Um, 
these things are generally maintained and you sort of have people who either moderate content and remove it if it's bad or who um, uh, check the content before allowing it to be published. Um, there might be a possibility of somehow using this system to automate some of that. Um, I haven't explored it in detail, but it could be an area. Um, so related to collaboration is disintermediation, which is a ridiculously long word for basically saying get rid of the middleman, get rid of having some kind of um, centralized controlling organization that um, handles access and control for you. Um, we're very used to these, um, these middlemen. We use them with things like stockbrokers, or if you've got a visa card, then um, your payment system, you're using a middleman. And we, and we pay um, a commission to these middlemen for doing that. You pay your stockbroker a small um, percentage of your uh, transaction if, if they're buying shares for you. If you're buying goods with uh, your card, the shop that's selling the goods is actually paying two, two and a half percent to Visa and you're eventually paying that because they put the prices up to cover that cost. So with a blockchain you can actually remove the need for having this central organization handling that kind of stuff. And that means that the individual participants on the blockchain can maintain control over it um, and build relationships and actually prevent individuals from being locked out. Um, if one of these middlemen decides they don't want to deal with you, then you're in trouble. If, if a bank won't give you a bank account, you can't trade. Um, but with a blockchain, you may be able to remove that need. Um, and then finally, they're distributed. So because you have all these different participants who are all running a copy of the blockchain, it automatically becomes a multi-site system. And that gives you a number of benefits. It protects you against distributed denial of service attacks because the thing has spread itself across the, um, the internet. And this is the same reason that the authorities have problems bringing down you know, some of these uh, torrent file sharing systems, because there's no one particular area that you can target. Well, with a blockchain, you get this for free. Um, it synchronizes the data, so you're getting automatic backups as well. So that's kind of a nice freebie that you get with a, uh, a blockchain. So, that was a fairly quick summary of how blockchains work. Um, and I thought now I'd move on to a, uh, a tweet from Dries Fotard back uh, about a year ago, where he asked, what could the blockchain mean for a content management system like Drupal? Um, that's a good question to ask. Um, when I went and did some research a couple of weeks ago, I found 11 modules related to blockchain and I scrapped out the uh, ones that had been dead for a while or looked like they weren't going anywhere and these are the four top ones I could find. So there was a commerce blockchain module for Bitcoin payments. Um, two sites reported using it and it's not an active development. There was an extension to Ubercart shopping cart to allow you to make Bitcoin payments. Um, there was one from uh, BlockCypher, which gives you an API into BlockCypher.com, which allows you to look at the status of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, and then there was a module that is heavily under development, but is really, really at the early stages for allowing you to do API calls to a particular blockchain called Ethereum. Um, so it doesn't look particularly active to me. And there seems to be a very heavy focus on Bitcoin. So. <laughs> Um, I don't think that uh, Dries' uh, request has really been answered particularly well at this point. But it was made early on, so you know, the landscape's changed a lot in the last year, and so maybe we're actually starting to get somewhere where something could happen. So this is my take on this, is you can't just go, blockchain, let's use one, and now how are we going to use it? Um, which seems to have been the, pro the approach in 2016. Um, I think the first thing you have to do is actually come up with a use case. Look at the properties of a blockchain and think, and look at a problem that you're trying to solve and match the two together. Um, so, and then you need to determine that is a blockchain actually really relevant? If you can do, if you can resolve your use case with a database, then you should go and use a database because databases have been under development for 50 years. Um, blockchains have been around for 10. Um, so, 
And then the final thing, I think, is that you should do it in small increments. You see projects out there where they're going to change the world and they're going to take blockchain technology and everybody's going to have an international passport on a blockchain or a country's going to switch from using their own currency to using a blockchain currency. These are, these are really, really big steps to take. And when you look at it technically, yeah, a bunch of clever guys can sit down and maybe code something up and it works. But it's not actually the coding that's the hard part, it's the social side of things. It's getting people to adopt it. Um, coding can be done relatively quickly, but changing the way people think, that takes a lot more time. So those are the three sort of things I would consider if you're thinking about a blockchain project. Establish a use case, determine that blockchain really is relevant, and then have a way of doing it in small steps. So if we now look at the uh, Drupal architecture, you see, uh, there's MySQL sitting at the bottom. I know you can plug in Postgres. That's your database of choice. But I think most people go with what comes out of the box. Um, so you've got this content management system. It's built on top of a database browser to access it. And then you plug in these modules. And I have to confess here, what I'm particularly interested in at the moment is how can you take legacy databases, legacy data, and put it on a blockchain to get the benefits of blockchain. Um, and I think in that sense, Drupal actually lends itself quite nicely. You have a whole bunch of modules that allow you to um, uh, provide an interface for adding database to table, uh, database data um, to the MySQL database in the form of tables. Um, you have a way of viewing that data and presenting it to the user. Um, so we have these modules there that allow you to actually say, I'm going to create a data structure in my Drupal site, and I'm going to push it into the MySQL system. And I'm, as an administrator, you're not actually worried about what the table structure is. It just works. So it would be nice if you could do the same with blockchain. Because then you could say, right, I have two Drupal systems. I have some data in each of them that I would like to be able to share between them. And I would like to do that in a way that's tamper-proof, that we can collaborate, um, build trust, and that we don't need to have some kind of central repository or central database maintained by someone for us where we copy our stuff and then retrieve it. Um, so this is, it's a fairly high-level view of it, but basically that kind of summarizes the connection. Um, so if we go down to the MySQL level, when you create um, some custom data, um, some custom content, if you go and look in the table, you'll see this, these tables are created and the rows are filled with a particular data for each entry that you make. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing at uh, Chainfrog is we've been looking at how can we make a way of connecting an existing database very simply to an existing blockchain system. So. That's us, the frogs, sort of sitting there in the middle. And at the moment, we're working quite closely with Multichain, which is a blockchain system forked from the Bitcoin source code. But its focus has moved away from cryptocurrency and more towards uh, sharing data. Um, and at the moment, we have a bunch of uh, developer tools that we're using for individual projects um, to take a database that's in existence, connect Multichain to it, and then invite other database administrators to use the same multi-chain Bitcoin binary to connect it all in together and have a one large shared blockchain. Um, and this applies to Drupal as well. If uh, an administrator identifies a particular section of their MySQL database that they think could um, be shared in some kind of valuable way to other Drupal sites, by connecting it through a blockchain system, um, that would happen. And at that point, as an administrator, you don't really need to worry anymore about what's going on under the hood. Um, it should just work. So that's the solution that we're proposing at the moment. And this is where I think the blockchain becomes relevant to Drupal. Um, so uh, we've uh, done a pilot recently. Um, we also hold workshops to discuss um, working out these use cases and um, determining if you actually have a blockchain use case that makes sense. Um, and we can also provide consultancy to determine there's about 15 or 20 competing blockchain ecosystems out there 
and we can determine which of those ones might actually be more relevant to your use. Are you looking at um, financial markets or are you looking at high volume transactions or are you looking at security and data and uh, or maybe anonymity? There's, there's a whole bunch of different choices there. So that's something we can help with too. And we've worked with people um, who are working on intellectual property rights and cloud services uh, with academia and also with um, RFID tags. So we've got a sort of fairly broad use case experience. Um, so that's basically my presentation and I thought I would keep the talking part sort of down to a, a lesser part and actually give people an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have some questions, please fire away. Okay. One question has to do with, uh, with Drupal, but it would be something I would build in Drupal. I would, I'm thinking about doing a crowd uh, sourcing uh, system yeah. where I open up a, an interface yeah. and people will uh, well, basically scan really old documents yeah. and type in what they can read. Um, the, 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 the thing is there's a lot of documents, like there's like half a million documents uh, that I want to open for people to, to index. Uh, and I want, and I know that people are, go, some of them are going to read something, mm -hmm. others are going to read something completely different, um, because it's really, when I mean old documents, they're really old, like three or four centuries old. Okay. Um, they're not, the, the, you don't write like that anymore, <laughs> nobody does. Um, and my point is, uh, I think there's, a, there's going to be a lot of edits. People are going to come in, and they're going to, 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 to type in some, something, and I'm going to be able to want uh, other people to say, no, that's wrong. And at one point, I want to be able to, um, to identify vandalism. Somebody coming in, just typing in crap, and, uh, and saying, uh, and having some friends of them just saying, hey, this is the, the real uh, results, and, basic, and, and destroying database. And I want to be able to, to have a structure that tells me every change mm -hmm. that happened, yeah. uh, by whom, and the way that eventually I could go in and like uh, revert all those changes that, those, that these people did. Right. Um, a blockchain seems like a pretty good uh, alternative to, to be able on one end to, to, to preserve all this information, to know who did what at what time. Yeah. Um, would it, is there already some, some, some kind of system for that is built for this kind of crowdsourced, uh, crowdsourced platform? You, you mean a crowdsourced or crowdsourced? Crowd. 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 Like, I want, I want this to be open to everybody. A million people. Right. To edit. Well, I have to be honest, though, I don't think I'm going to be able to come up with a solution. Just, you know, yeah, I know. It's just flash. And there is this thing called the interplanetary file system, which is hooked into Ethereum, which is a particular blockchain. That's meant for handling sort of files on a blockchain. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I got the add to this. It seems to me that it's more like an access and a personal problem than a data problem. Uh, if you have your data in your group or with your revisions, and you would use something like DNS chain, which would substitute 501 certificates, where you could have your users identified and the access uh, governed by the blockchain, yeah. uh, you wouldn't have to put all this data in the expensive blockchain storage. Yeah, so that could be an, an, an entry point to get a solution for this kind of problem. Yeah, I think you're talking there, it's indeed it's about identity yeah. rather than data. I mean, you do, with blockchain, you do get this um, permanent record of, and the way you update data in a blockchain is by saying it's now changed from that to this, and so you see the complete history. I mean, there are file systems that do that as well. Um, uh, you do get this identity um, aspect to it. Yeah. I didn't actually touch on that. I, I get the point, and I think that Floris did mention something that I didn't think about, which is the expensive part of it. Um, mm. 
Yeah, because in the end, uh, the data would be massive, and uh, yeah. this is something that, that I, I would be doing for free, mm -hmm. almost. Okay. So maybe maybe the block, yeah, maybe something that that just uses the blockchain for authentication. Yeah. This question over here. So. There is similar uh, mechanisms, for example, in Wikipedia and other wiki pages, that uh, somebody from some IP address has made a lot of spam, and that all can be removed at, at the same time. Yeah. So maybe some some there are. Uh, Wiki is implemented in many programming languages and, and some use databases, so you could see something similar from there. Yeah. Probably. The, the problem is I think that the, the vandalism part is built on top of the older Wiki infrastructure and not at the database layer of the Wiki. Maybe, I don't I think it's bots that are built on top of the wiki. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can't see an immediate solution to it, and I think sort of ripping on blockchain I mean, solutions just form is probably not the ideal. I, 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 think, I think, I think my, my answer has been yeah. sort of answered, mm -hmm. that, I, that the blockchain here would be more optimal towards just the authentication part uh, than actually to store the whole data, because be. the data would be massive and expensive. I think on the database at a level, you only need to have uh, uh, one uh, column that sto stores the user ID or some, something, so you can de delete everything that one user ID has made. And revert it. Yeah. Yes. One ID pair for one user. And there also, can, with, with the user ID can be uh, timestamp uh, when, when the, it has been made, so with SQL queries you can delete from certain time range all of that user. Mm. Uh, yeah. There's a few more complicated, because that user is a vandal, but maybe also open for other vandals, and I kind of want to um, I haven't had a customer client come to me yet and say I want to hook um, Drupal up to a blockchain. Um, uh, well, we, under NDA, so I can't say too many details, but we, we had a pilot project and it basically involves a database with um, sets of data, some of which they want to share and some they don't. And the data that they do want to share is to be shared with other people who aren't part of the company. Uh, so the question there was how are we going to get that data from an existing database into a blockchain? And um, this is what my company is basically focusing on, is connecting existing database systems to blockchains um, in a sensible and easy to use way. With the previous speaker on the other side in the back of my head, which was about the GDPR <coughs> compliance, mm -hmm. I think it would be a great asset for Drupal, but also for blockchain, if we could have our personal data in the blockchain, mm -hmm. and then use that uh, after authentication in the website to provide this personal data where needed. Mm -hmm. It would lift us from having to have the, the copy everything out and all the other mm -hmm. uh, restraints. Yeah. Uh, which approach would you suggest in order to do such a thing? Well, there's, um, there's this bit nation project uh, where a group of people are trying to come up with a blockchain-backed system for passports. So the idea is that you get rid of the need for every country to issue a passport and your identity is stored on a blockchain. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch, there's like a whole can of worms that gets opened up there because um, you can keep data secret on a blockchain by encrypting it and then giving the decryption key to the party that you want to. But like Sony found out with the uh, um, DVD secret key, once it's out there, the data is now freely available and you can't go back and find it. So you, you have this sort of problem. And with the blockchain, even if a government mandates that somebody has to remove it, you know, at the moment they can go to Google and say, we want you to remove these pages. And they can wipe them off the server. And some people may have kept backups, but Google's comply. But with a public blockchain, it, once it's there, it's there. You can't go back and remove it. So there's there's some issues there that would need to be 
would take some serious thought. A digital rights asset, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. The only big downside would be that if I lose my key, mm -hmm. that I lose my identity. Yeah. So I need to have a backup with several peers with whom I can recover my master key in order to get my data back. Yeah. Well, th this is the problem that people face with Bitcoin. Right? Mm -hmm. You lose your key, and if you've got a um, thousand Bitcoins sitting in there, you're looking at uh, you know, serious sure. money. It was a million, I think, or something. So um, I think that kind of stuff is going to develop. And indeed, it does lend itself very nicely to, to identity because of the, uh, um, the, the asymmetric key system we use. And in fact, there's some people talking about the PKI systems being managed. And I think that would relate to what you're talking about. So you have your identity and your login credentials and stuff stored on the blockchain. And that's publicly available. And then private individual Drupal installs could hook into that and do the authentication through there. So I haven't thought about that, but that's good. Um, any further? Yes, <coughs> what, uh, I, what I got from previous PDBR talk was that um, uh, each, each customer or person needs, needs to have those those data in one place and in common format and uh, it need to be able to delete, delete all of that so um, uh, I'm thinking that um, actually I lost my door. sorry okay. um, are there any other questions or anything people want to discuss I mean I skimmed over blockchain very rapidly Anybody has a particular question about that? Could you give some example about your project where uh, you know for sure that you save money or time or both by choosing this question? Well, we've only worked on pilots at this stage, so there's no hard financial data that I can call on. Um, but uh, when you have a project where you have a consortium of um, companies at an equal level, and they don't want to uh, delegate the sort of chief role to one particular company. And then you have a situation where, at the moment, they all have their individual databases, and we're talking about things from like, you know, some of the databases from the 70s or 80s right up to um, modern sort of MongoDB installs. And they're trying to transfer uh, large quantities of data between each other. And they're doing it by, for example, doing CSV dumps into a text file, attaching it to an email, and then sending it to the other company. And that company, as a person whose job it is, as this is what they come in and do every day, is um, download the attachment, and then feed it into the database, and then handle all the errors that are hit. Um, and that's their life. Um, you know, and so I guess if you have a system that gets rid of um, needing to do that, and you actually, and, and blockchain can be used to sort of drive a reform system in some of these databases, where you kind of go, look, there will be an upfront cost to get the system running, but look at your legacy systems and think about what it is that you have had somebody do in the last 10, 15 years. Um, so I think in that sense, there are some very clear settings. And that is just without even taking the um, extra properties of the um, blockchain into account. Um, plus, well, I don't know if it's a plus or not. Maybe the person likes their job and they don't want to use it. But I think it's a shocking waste of human ingenuity and time to have them dealing with um, loading CSV files into the database system. So I haven't got any numbers that I can give you. There was a case, uh, I think Microsoft published one recently, where they they had a process basically a letter, a letter of credit between departments, which is sort of when one department lends Maybe fifty or hundred thousand dollars to another one for a project, and it needed to be signed off by people. And they estimated that the cost of creating one of these letters of credit was about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars in employee time, and it took about two weeks. And they used the blockchain system to automate it because you have digital signing on the blockchain, and they cut it down to I think two hours um, work. So uh, there's a concrete example of two weeks down to. Two hours and a saving of about twelve thousand um, dollars, and it worked because a company like Microsoft, a very big company, has offices all over the world. They all have different ways of operating, even though it's the same company. So that kind of allowed them to standardise and automate a lot of the process.
processes. Okay. Yes. Um, it's maybe a little too specific, but from a Drupal perspective, I'm just wondering how could I go back to like my company or whomever and say, we want to audit everything that's happened on our client's Drupal site using blockchain. Like, mm -hmm. like what would the first thing be that one would need to do to say, okay, every time someone changes a block uh, or a view or does anything mm -hmm. in the admin system, that that connects with the blockchain and there's... Right. So if you look at the uh, MySQL database, I mean, uh, you'll see that all this stuff is locked in tables and um, rows within those tables. Um, so the kind of first easiest way would to basically say every time there's a transaction on the database, you have a watcher and it just copies that onto the uh, blockchain. And then as the blockchain grows over time, you have a sort of time-stamped immutable record of every single change. And, and it's a bit like a, I mean, you can do an SQL dump from the database and then run it again and recreate it. But the dump as it stands doesn't have the time stamping and the um, locking down of the data in a tamper-proof manner. So by having something like this running, monitoring the um, database all the time, and you need to make sure that you can't sneak in and do a transaction without a monitor detecting it, so you have some issues there. But if you set that system up right, then the blockchain will have a record of every change, every everything. If you copy the whole database on there, you have everything in there. So it's really more my MySQL level? Uh, it has to be, yeah. yeah. I mean, the other stuff is web front end. Yeah. Right? There, there are some backups and systems, at least for Postgres, but maybe for MySQL, well, that, uh, that the uh, change stream and, and backup is it so that so it's go, possible to go back back in time and forward and get keep, get it uh, in a sensible amount of space. But, mm -hmm. So it's it's much um, more sane than doing dumps and spending so much uh, this space all the time. Yeah. Well, that it allows you to roll back the database. Yes. But what it doesn't allow you to do is then to go to a um, an auditor and say, look, I can prove that this is what happened. Yes. Um, because any administrator in, in, would in some security monitoring systems uh, uh, proof, proofs of so those logs that are there, they haven't been modified at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it, there's different kind of rules, uh, what kind of data, Keep and when the disk is full, then it uh, just keeps most of the summaries of, of previous data. That, the, that kind of logging systems uh, are then possible to use some, in some legal cases and so on. Okay. We've got another five minutes, so if anybody has anything else in the raise or any questions. Uh, how can this uh, apply to this GDPR right to erasure? If uh, some personal data enters blockchain, uh, then uh, 2018 comes in May, mm -hmm. and uh, someone data says, I want to be out. Mm. That's a good question. Do you want to yes. Uh, for example, with Ethereum, we can make contract negotiations uh, where I hand you a contract, uh, and if you don't fulfill it, I can cancel your contract and give it to another. Technically, that's exactly the same as the GDPR asks for. So by changing my cipher, I invalidate that you, your site, may use my data, and I move my stuff to the other site where I give another public key that they can use my data. So you don't have to be moving. I'm in control. This is really good. If I have that one, that uh, to be forgotten, a lot of my nice previous yeah. actions just you flip the problem. Instead of providing, giving your personal data to the site, you give access to your personal data in the blockchain, mm. and you can invalidate that whenever you wish. Much easier. Mm. But you lose the um, uh, the sort of order trail and tamper proof nature for that personal data. And this this is the thing. You, then you're basically handing keys to a locker room. But if you decide um, 
the, the problem there is, and well, I suppose you can publish uh, hashes of the data on the uh, blockchain, and then that way you can ensure the data integrity. So that, that solves that. Um, but I don't know if the regulation is kind of goes down to this sort of level. But, uh, it just says, and I think they're kind of thinking in traditional, you have a disk, please wipe it. Terms. So I don't know how they'll deal with that. That's only one two databases, but if I'm like a person. Yeah, but it enters yeah. my data into your Drupal, mm -hmm. uh, which has connection to some blockchain. And, um, be a uh, there are two different things because uh, the personal data is usually uh, what what me, what you have more more details about your customer. But uh, what what I got from previous talk was that. Uh, the security monitoring, like uh, IP address and so on, is uh, different and can, can be kept longer for security reasons. So, so it, it's uh, and there is no need, need actually in most cases to delete, delete that data mm. if it for protecting other information and protecting customers. I have to admit I'm not an expert on the data protection laws that are coming up. So I think a bit more from the technical point of view. That, that's not only my understanding yeah. from that, but of course it, it needs to be checked. Yeah. Please, uh, I see if it's better usage between banking systems or something like that. But you see, I don't know what would qualify as personal data. I mean, obviously, if you. Uh, Almost anything. Yeah. Because if, if you decide to put some. Through some method, some data mm -hmm. of, uh, of your own about yourself. If you decide to put your name and address on yeah. the Bitcoin blockchain, it's there. Um, mm -hmm. And you can go back and look at the history. People have put all sorts of stuff on there. Yeah. And, and you can't get rid of it now. And it's on, I, mean, I think there's 7,000 active nodes. It's on all the databases. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and it's on all of them. Um, so, uh, what happens? I don't know if you can turn around and say, look, I did a transfer from this address to that address and they're mine, and now I want it removed. I don't know what. Sure be. I mean, maybe it's just going to be that it's unenforceable. And if you have, certainly if you have an open public um, blockchain, there's no individual you can go after, right? Um, in the way that if you have a company running a database, you can say they're the ones who've been ordered to remove this data. But I don't know what would happen if a government ordered that Bitcoin removed a particular transaction. I mean, who's, who, do they, who do they issue that order to? Who do they sue? Each specific individual who runs the chain, so it will never happen. That's why yeah. it's genius. Yeah. Well, it, it's the same as the um, as the Bitcoin stuff, really. Is that uh, you can't? It's, it's distributed. It's um. You know, there's no individual you can go after. You can try really hard. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> what what you can do is you can um, instigate fear by really hammering down on one person. You know, but. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 Context, they're sitting on top of the end node where there's HTTP from the end node to you, and they can monitor your IP from there and change you from there. You go from the desktop to the blockchain directly. You need to hack your desktop in order to find out what you'll be doing. Mm -hmm. I did ask after previous talk that uh, the data protection as of concerns emails of this could mean that uh, each email messages about each good customer needs, needs to be separated and be able to be de deleted. And I don't know any system yet that has that, has that feature. Well, we'll see what happens, I think. Yeah. I mean, this uh, like a lot of these kind of laws when they exist. What I was talking about at the beginning, this collision between technical and social. Um, this is a big social decision and I think the technical ramifications will still need to be seen. The major problem with email is that for each sent email, you have to uh, report a data leakage 72 hours later. Because most are sent or received unencrypted. Yes, this, this that means that for email providers, there need to be more automated system to particularize the data. So maybe we should get rid of the protocol. Yes, that's very likely because, because there have been alternative protocols for IMAN and so on that take much less data and are easier for mobile phones. Okay.
Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope it was useful. And um, feel free to hang around and ask me anything to the one if you want.